And this is the second of the propaganda lectures, second of three. And um, this one focuses on, it, it begins to apply um, some of what we looked at in the first lecture, basically. So, um, you know, <laughs> it's one thing to look at these nice lists of fallacies and, you know, have sort of examples that are static. But what happens when you're out in the world and um, it's life, you know, <laughs> that's, that's when you need to sort of, okay, you need to start just applying things. Basically, you just start applying things, you know, you don't, and you're not going to get it right every time. You're not going to get it wrong every time. That's all right. So it's like anything, right? Okay, so we'll just proceed, right? That's all we can do, <laughs> proceed. Okay, so this first thing is about creating others. And you can see I've quoted from the great Konstantin Kabafi, an Egyptian Greek poet, Greek Egyptian poet, um, who wrote this famous poem, Waiting for the Barbarians, which is about um, a people basically uh, who gets used to creating itself in terms of others and create in terms of these barbarians. Uh, and uh, when they stop coming, after a while, the people in the, in the settlement community, whatever it is, not really clear, city, nation, group, realize that, as he says, these people were a kind of solution. And that's what this, uh, that's what this propaganda is about. The, the thing about having an enemy is you have to have an enemy if you're going to create, say, agitation propaganda. And you don't want to, the idea is not to overcome the enemy and wipe them out. That's it's the same thing as having, you know, a bad guy in a movie. Um, you know, there's no, not going to be any sequel if you don't keep the bad guy. You got to keep the bad guy alive, right? <laughs> and so, you know, and then, then one of the good guys becomes the next bad guy. And you got to have, okay, but there always has to be a bad guy. This is how agitation propaganda works. So one of the first things it does is, as I've talked about before, is it establishes who the self is and who the other is. And the other um, can be any other. Okay, so for instance, let's take this thing. All right. Now, after the Twin Towers were attacked uh, September 11th, 2001, after a couple of days, Bush went on uh, to the a joint... Um, joint session of the House, and he spoke to the Senate and the Congress at the same time, and he said, basically, there are only two kinds of people in the world. Either you're with us or you're with terrorists. And this is a false dilemma, right? We know it right away. It's either, either this or that. Well, we know what that sounds like. It's a false dilemma. Really? These are the only two positions we could occupy? How about... Um, I don't like what Bin Laden did, and I'm not a fan of Bin Laden, and I'm not a fan of Bush either. How about that? You know, what a, oh, what a concept, you know, but no. This makes the world very simple. Everybody is either outside the group or, or they are the group. That's it. It's a false dilemma. And this was the beginning of a war which was going to be based on um, yet more uh, argumentative fallacies. Why? would you base something like this on argument and fallacies? Because people are upset and you want to keep them upset. You don't want to make a reasoned, rational argument, not if you're this group of people. Uh, this White House wanted to go to war. And if they wanted to go to war, then they had to gin up a war, as we would say. Okay, so another example of how to create the other is to shame the other and to prevent them from being presented basically as human beings. So here's the London Free Press um, that to their shame uh, <clears throat> on December of a year and a half after the attacks uh, published they when they finally caught Saddam who had been hiding in uh, well they said they said he'd been hiding in a bolt hole basically um, who knows exactly but uh, somebody was hiding him out and um, in Iraq, and he hadn't had a chance to have a shave or uh, get his hair cut. Well, uh, it was perfect for the West, and so as you can see, all the uh, 
heroes up at the top here. You know, we welcome this development. Oh, Paul Martin. <laughs> Paul Martin. Oh, geez. All these guys up here who all have, uh, yeah, the th oh, man, the three amigos. Um, Bush is on our, is at the very left, then Paul Martin, and then... Uh, Um, the Brit, <clears throat> who was a real piece of work. Um, okay, so, uh, however, this is what's known as shaming the enemy. And if we look at the Geneva Convention, which remember we sign, we are signatories to, well, Canada is, and NATO is, and so is the United States, and we signed, look at this, the date on this Geneva Convention, July 1929, where prisoners shall at all times be humanely treated and protected, particularly against acts of violence from insults and from public curiosity. Now, what could be the possible newsworthiness of showing Saddam before his haircut, which I would say is a, a COVID-like state. I mean, I pretty much looked like that after three months in, inside after COVID, during COVID. And um, I, I didn't have the beard quite. It is quite the beard. Um, it's very impressive. And um, but yeah, you know, all of us, a lot of us look like that. And then of course here he is after he's been caught by these civilizing tribes um, and cleaned up. You know, and now he looks back. He looks like his old self. You know, the dictator. Okay, great. So, what is the possible news value of showing these images? Well, there isn't any. The value is in morale. Right? That what you're showing is, and this is so perfect, you know, I write in a photo release book, here's, here's shown shaven and in custody. It's like, oh, okay. So this is after, before, when he was a wanted villain, after, after he's been caught by the civilized tribes. Okay. So this is another example of how you make an other, right? He's still the other, but now that we've got him, he's been civilized. Well, this is, goes completely in, in contradiction to, uh, to uh, Geneva. Can you imagine parading, I mean, par parading prisoners, uh, basically, and then killing them on the internet, let's say, um, was one of the things that uh, the Taliban and ISIS became famous for. Well, how is this any different? Well, we're not killing him. Well, not right at that point. We eventually did, right? I mean, we did hang Saddam, and <laughs> we tried to prevent images of that getting out so that he wouldn't be martyred. But then somebody did take little piece of cell phone footage of Saddam getting hung and everybody watched it because they thought it was newsworthy. I'm not sure how, but okay. All right, so then we move on to another way of rendering people as things. And this is what this is really about, is that you know one of the ways of propaganda against people uh, operates, and you can see where this is going, that is you render, you, you work to render people as not human beings anymore. If they're not human beings anymore, as the Jews well know from being uh, talked about as lice, rats, and so on by the Nazis, you can exterminate them. You use pesticides, you can gas them, and so on. It's like, well, yeah, uh, that's not just, it wasn't just the Nazis that, that work on that kind of, like they're not human beings. You know, they're, they're in the case of the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda, they're cockroaches. It's like, okay. Well, so here, during the war, the in Iraq and Afghanistan, this specifically has to do with Iraq, um, the United States issued this uh, deck of cards, as it came to be known, which is what it is. And you can see that it's sort of an unusual deck of cards in that they didn't cut the corners, they didn't chamfer the corners uh, properly, you know, they didn't actually make a proper deck of cards out of these. But they did issue one to every soldier in the field. Well, why would you do that? I mean, really, are you gonna, the soldiers in the field are gonna run around and gonna find these guys? Because all of these guys are supposed to be high value targets. So the idea is that these are your, these are your enemies. These are the people you want. You wanna get a hold of these people and you're gonna you know, crush the Ba'athist Rebellion. This is Saddam's uh, political party, the Ba'ath Party, um, by catching all these, these you know, evil villains, terrorists. Um, even though Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, still, that's the link that uh, Bush um, and I cannot remember the name of that. Oh, such a loathsome individual, too. <laughs> Jesus. 
Uh, I keep I've got Comey in my mind. I'm not sure why Comey seems like a you know, at least a decent guy. Anyway, whoops. Wait a minute. Am I recording? I am recording. Oh, okay. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> perfect. Okay, so um, when we look at this uncut deck of cards, what you're looking at is uh, basically the, the 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 most wanted list. Well, when you issue a, a deck of cards like this, so I've put in one of my own copies of these decks, um, which were freely available. Um, they were considered to be a sort of souvenir. I mean, people wanted them, and so on. And um, so I broke open a pack so you could see what they actually look like. And um, okay, the idea is that you aren't, re there's no way that all the soldiers running around um, say, oh, I don't know, wherever they might be are gonna come across these people. And because they were taking in hundreds of people a day and putting them in prison, and keeping them in camps and stuff like that. as well as they had people on the battlefield who were mercenaries who were because they posted uh, bounties uh, basically for the for the individuals so they were like you know this person's worth ten thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars and so on um, if they be turned in um, but the idea stays the same if you can reduce people to as alice alice in wonderland as alice says in alice in wonderland a pack of cards you're nothing but a pack of cards is what she says at the end of the uh, the book then you can kill them and you don't have to worry about it because they're just a deck of cards it's, you, you turn it into a game right and if you've got an army which has raised on video games which you do at this point um because people have at this point in 2001 uh you're if you're say soldier is roughly 20 years old uh, well they've been playing video games probably most of their lives uh then the idea of sort of chasing down targets and getting paid for it, although the soldiers weren't paid, um, is, is normal. So you can see how the Joker um, has a list of, of all the, the names. So uh, 